Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Hanover Messe Digital Days. I'm Declan Curry. I'm a journalist and broadcaster and I've been covering business and the economy for nearly 30 years. Uh, I'm in conversation with Badr al Olama, who's the head of the organising committee at the Global Manufacturing and Industrialisation Summit GMIS. Uh, Badr, great to uh, talk to you. Let's start with the summit because we were all looking forward to meeting in person at the Hanover Messe earlier this year and then uh, coronavirus got in the way of that and you've had to reinvent the summit as a digital event. How have you done that? How have you felt it's gone? I mean, when you look at the context of what the summit is all about, it's about the global gathering. It's about bringing everybody together. It's about, you know, talking about the future of manufacturing. It's about even exploring new opportunities and, and, and new ideas. And, and honestly, when, when everything started sort of clamping down, we reached out to our partners, the Deutsche Messe team, and we said, look, this is important to us. Uh, we're still committed to the relationship. We're still committed that Hanover Messe is the world's largest industrial fair. How can we make this happen? And again, it wasn't a stroke of luck. If we've been talking about the future of manufacturing and we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution, you know, then technology is the solution. So we basically repurposed what was supposed to be a physical event into something that is now very digital. And it's made it much more, much more, much more convenient for everyone. Not to miss out on the great outcomes that we obviously aspire by having the global gathering, but at the same time, making sure Everyone is safe and everyone is secure. And it's also created a platform to allow leaders in business and industry around the world to talk about the crisis and how you navigate successfully through the crisis and come out even better at the end of it. I mean, when you think about our program, absolutely. This is the topic of interest at the moment. How can technology act as an enabler to make sure that our that any disruption to our way of life, any disruption to our business is mitigated? So when you look at the program agenda that we've put together, it does address topics to do with the heightened risk of cybersecurity. It has to do with repurposing business for the future economy. How do we future-proof our businesses? It talks about localization. I mean, that was the theme of our, you know, GMS 2020 at, at the Hanover Messe. It was about localization before the pandemic. It was about how can you get technology to enable local capacity to be built so that it could, so you could end up with more flexible supply chains. And what better time to address these topics of great interest than the post-COVID era? And I think that is why the program agenda is addressing these specific topics, because it's, it's a fact. COVID-19 has accelerated innovation. Yes, it's a real sort of irony, isn't it, that all these years at uh, the summit, we've been talking about how industry is being transformed by the embrace of the digital technology, and then it's happened uh, directly to the uh, summit itself. How does this crisis, you, you mentioned some of the areas where this is pertinent, how does this crisis spur future innovation and create future opportunity? I mean, the, the, the one thing that I, I'm, I believe has been very good uh, for technology with respect to the crisis has been that we are no longer fear-mongering the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution will have certain consequences, but if we can embrace it and if we could deploy it in the right areas, at the right moments, uh, in the right um, environments, the potential of it could be far greater. So what, we, what, what have we seen with respect to um, specifically the acceleration of innovation through COVID-19. We've seen that certain uh, companies have been accelerating their technologies as a result of their environment, as a result of the disruption that was caused by the pandemic. And we've seen certain companies develop new technologies and develop new areas, which could basically allow two things to happen. One is preserve my business. Two is to create a natural immunity against any future disruption. So when you take those sort of two aspects, recovery and immunity, you are seeing that both industry and the technology companies are working hand in hand to make sure that you know, there is a post-COVID economy that could you know, sort of deflect any potential uh, disruption in the future. And, and some other things that I'd, you know, I'd like to point out, we've seen manufacturing companies that have repurposed their capabilities to produce essential per, uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. 
at a time when countries are either banning the exports or they are uh, they are in shortages or they don't even have those essential PPEs. We've seen researchers, you know, uh, opening up uh, their, uh, their 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 opening up their their information and opening up their their uh, databases to the rest of the world in terms of what they have been finding with result with respect to the the virus and its impacts. All the research related to it has been made open source because humanity is collaborating together to make sure that they can mitigate and they can you know sort of uh, rebound from from the impact that covid-19 has caused and more importantly you see that you know the startup ecosystem the startup ecosystems have been fabulous they've just been you know driving those entrepreneurs and driving those smes to come up with solutions that could enable the businesses to recover from the impact and what we've seen is that the crisis has encouraged companies and the people who work for them to embrace an enormous amount of change in a relatively short period of time it's brought about the type of transformation that had you been planning it might have taken years if not decades to implement them and people have shown that they're quite comfortable with these new digital ways of working look at how many people are now working from home as standard i think you and i uh, are both <laughs> in that situation I think you you hit the nail on the head with this one, Declan. I mean, some companies. I, I like to take it into the context of three things. Some companies will sink, some companies will swim, and some companies will surf. And that's all based on the maturity of their digital readiness, right? So those that were not really willing to to adopt digital technologies into their business processes, into their operational model, are just going to basically sink now. And they've realized that the three months, the four months, have been brutal to everyone with respect to the lockdowns and, and the quarantining of, uh, of uh, individuals and, and of, uh, you know, putting uh, capacity, uh, capacity caps on people, the workforce at, uh, at the facilities. Those that would swim have already been experimenting with digital technologies, but they've been looking at it more from the operational aspects. So how could they drive cost out? How could they be more efficient? How could they drive, you know, remote working environments such as the ones that you and I are on at the moment on a, on a video conference? But I believe the ones that will surf are the ones that have embraced the fourth industrial revolution, not just to sort of uh, uh, transform their operational model, but also to transform their business model. And there are some fantastic examples, absolutely fantastic examples. One that I could give right at you know, on the top of my mind is how Alibaba has revolutionized the supermarket experience. Everyone, including myself, when I go to the supermarket uh, and I have to go through the aisles, and I have to avoid bumping into people with my with my trolley and my daughter runs in all different directions to get chocolates or to get, you know, uh, some snacks. And I have to wait in those long lines. Well, now I go with my phone into any of Alibaba's supermarkets in China and I scan the QR codes and I leave the supermarket and less than 30 minutes, whatever I want to buy is delivered to my house. This is how you transform the business model and the operational model to get, you know, unexpected outcomes that actually create value, not just deliver value. And a lot of that change behavior will stick in the future. It will become the new normal uh, for businesses. And I know that uh, during the GMIS summit, there is a panel discussion about how you can take the best examples from e-commerce, as you describe, and apply them to uh, an industrial setting. And there was an interesting uh, sort of range of scenarios uh, played out in that discussion. Let's look at it a little bit more detail, if we may, at what it actually means for manufacturing and industrial operations as they embrace the fourth industrial revolution technology. You speak of this with considerable experience because you have a background yourself in uh, the aerospace industry. But when we see the take up of artificial intelligence on the factory floor, when we see increased automation, and the greater use uh, of robots, and then you throw in machine learning as well through the internet, of things. There's enormous potential there to completely uh, restructure uh, the way that factories work efficiently all around the world. Absolutely. I mean, Declan, the three most important factors for any manufacturer is what? Resilience, flexibility, sustainability. And if you can address resilience, flexibility and sustainability in a form by using technology to strengthen the global value chains, to localize capabilities, to enable operations to continue by using artificial intelligence or robots, then you have a winning formula to actually manage your output, meet the demand, 
control your cost, improve your quality. I mean, it, it, it goes without, without saying that anybody in manufacturing is going to tell you a, a simple fact. Murphy is always lurking around. Murphy's law is happening every single day. We live with Murphy's law in a manufacturing environment. We know something will go wrong. But what technology brings is resilience, flexibility, and sustainability. And those three things is basically everything that the manufacturer could wish for. And that flexibility is something that has been at a premium in this particular crisis. And for some industries, I guess this is the new element that has been introduced to it is the ability to do all this remotely, whether it's uh, working, whether it's controlling industrial processes, whether it's monitoring uh, the effective operation, the safety elements uh, of the plant. There is a greater scope now to do all of that at a distance. I mean, you, again, you're, you're spot on. We, we talk about return on investment, right? And and most the biggest the biggest obstacle or the hurdle that a lot of companies had was when I want to embrace this technology. Great, you know, you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. It will change the way that I do business. It transforms my business model, transforms my operating model, but it comes at a cost. But let me ask you this question: At the time that we are living in, in light of the pandemic, in light of the disruption, in light of the uncertainty. The ROI for using these technologies is unmeasurable. You know, there is no dollar value that you can put on having video conferencing today. The, uh, as an example, when we talk about Zoom as a platform, uh, there was a, a nice little study that was, or an, actually an image that was put together that the value of Zoom as a company is equivalent to seven U.S. airlines. Seven U.S. airlines with the fleet of aircrafts, with the amount of people, with the kind of capex that they have, is equivalent to the value of Zoom, right? So it's immeasurable at a time when you have disruption and at a time when you have uncertainty. So the ROI, honestly, for companies that have invested long, long way before a situation like COVID-19 happened, is, is shooting to, through the roof. They're surfing at the moment. And, and, and they're enjoying every moment of their surf. You know, the wave has been perfect for them. And from your own experience in industry and from your many conversations with the uh, many uh, industries around the world that participate in GMIS, uh, it, it's fair to say that this transformation is going to happen all the way along the supply chain. It's going to have an impact on uh, the suppliers wherever they are in the world. It's going to have an impact on the actual central industrial process uh, that makes the product or delivers the service. And then it will have an impact uh, in the distribution side of the chain as well. Absolutely. I mean, Declan, the one thing that gets into my mind is a lot of people and a lot of companies and a lot of businesses are talking about how can we go back to pre-COVID times? They use pre-COVID as a benchmark. They use pre-COVID as, 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 uh, as a memory of you know, how great things were. What we need to accept is that there's a new normal coming in. The new normal will look considerably different from pre-COVID times. And, and that includes that you're going to get hybrid models of using digital tech with actual physical activity. And that new normal is going to be the new benchmark. And everybody should be talking and focusing and putting, you know, uh, just completely aligning with what that new normal is going to look like. So countries and, and businesses that are able to predict and shape up the new normal are going to be the real winners at the end of the game. It also means, though, that within business and between nations, the critical factor is going to be uh, the level of digital skills training uh, in the broader workforce, education, skills, uh, and training in uh, this whole digital area is going to be the essential differentiator. Uh, think about it this way. Today we use video conferencing for distance learning, right? It begs the question, are we going to relook at how schools are? Can I customize my curriculum such that I could do a little bit of the French system and a little bit of the English system and a little bit of the IB system? And, and that's what video conferencing and distance learning has allowed us to do. Does that mean that schools are going to be using the same kind of infrastructure that they've been doing in the past? Do we need that much space? Are they going to be more optimized for the use of actually going for a physical class or a physical event such as doing the examination or even doing some you know, uh, group activities? But what is even more important is how could I export 
some of the let's say skills that I'm doing in a manufacturing environment and look at look at the value that you get from augmented reality and virtual reality you're able to take all that learning put it into a virtual environment and I don't need to have you know a train the trainer concept anymore the train the trainer is actually being replaced by a gadget and that gadget can go to the poorest parts of the world and teach people how to manufacture stuff uh, it, it's not unreasonable to point out that there is a, a digital divide, that there are nations which are uh, have the good fortune of being able to invest heavily uh, in these areas and uh, have made the uh, deliberate decision to do so. There are other parts of the world where uh, investment is much lower uh, because uh, those nations uh, may not have the resources uh, to invest as heavily as the more advanced nations. How do we stop this increasing role of digitalization in industry, widening that gap? It's unfortunate that you have some parts of the world that are, that, are left, that are left very far behind. You know, when we talk about sort of pivoting or sort of uh, growing uh, above from actually manufacturing into, into digital, digital manufacturing, some countries don't have the basic manufacturing capabilities, and it's unfortunate. And when you look at them, you know, it's, it's access to, to food, water, healthcare, education, basic sanitation. sanitation. These, these are some of their biggest challenges. And on top of that, on top of all of that, you have the lack of internet connectivity. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's an interesting uh, data that's out there that says um, nearly half of the world were on the internet by 2019. In the developed world, nine out of 10 people had an internet connection. But in the least developed countries, about a fifth were able to go online. And just imagine going online doesn't mean that they were getting the full sort of 5G experience of going online. It just means that 20% in those de least developed countries had an opportunity to go online, to be, to be able to do learn, to, to be able to learn, to be able to uh, provide value, to be able to sell services, to, to be included within a global trading platform, which is going through the internet at the moment. And, and, and we take these things, I, I believe, a little bit for granted, because the advantage that you and I have at the moment of having a video conference, I mean, people that uh, in, in countries like, uh, uh, like the United Arab Emirates, which has, you know, thousands and hundreds of people that are coming from all sorts of different parts of the world, they get access to this kind of communication uh, using uh, 5G. Uh, but people on their, their, the other side of the world is a question mark. Can they really receive uh, a video conference? Can they actually see each other, especially when things are so bad and, and people are, are threatened by the pandemic? The way forward, no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, is about collaborative management. We need to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development, not because it's part of the SDGs, not because it's you know, something that uh, UNIDO professes with respect to SDG number nine and how we want to make sure that this world is more inclusive and that we're being more conscious about the environment. It's about making sure that we have the decency of taking care of everyone, everywhere, because if they're in a good situation, if their economy is in a good situation, that means the global trade, the global economy is much more resilient, is much more flexible, is much more sustainable. And that's the, the, the direction that we should all be pushing towards, collaborative management. So there is an obligation on nations that are more digitally advanced with companies that are larger and more capable of investing in this digital future. There's an obligation on them to help others who might otherwise be left behind. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, companies in the past weren't about just making a profit. Companies had a social responsibility, taking care of the welfare of all stakeholders. And if you are a global company, then guess what? Your global stakeholder is people everywhere. It's not just your workforce. It's not just your community of co consumers. It's your global community. And this is a responsibility that every global company has. For many companies, for many nations, that their priority at this moment in time is fighting the pandemic, is beating uh, coronavirus. Issues such as this, investing in infrastructure, investing in uh, high-speed internet, investing in a digital future, will have a lower priority. How do we ensure uh, that 
nations don't take their eye off the digital ball, that they continue to regard this as something that's essential and requires ongoing investment and improvement. I think it will happen naturally. The companies are going to lead the lead the way. It's not the, it's not the governments. The companies have realized that you know they've lost a lot of a lot of value as a result of the disruption, as a result of the uncertainty. Companies will drive the way for the next evolution of our digital capabilities in their factories, in their lives, in their products. Everything will 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 I believe will get accelerated. Now the thing that we would want from the governments is not to lose focus on on the climate crisis, and and how could we bridge? between the climate crisis and the digital revolution. That, to me, is a true partnership between the public sector and the private sector to get the benefit for civil society. So we need to keep our eye on the ball with respect to how are we going to make sure that we're going to tackle climate change and how the companies are we providing the right policies and the right framework for them to advance in their digital adoption and their digital uh, transformation. And there is a connection there. Uh, more digital ways of working can build more sustainable businesses with uh, a, a lighter footprint on the planet. Absolutely. You could use digital technology to manage your energy consumption as a simple way forward, right? Do we, do we really need to have uh, energy 24-7 uh, a day? Can, can digital solutions tell us which, which requirements do we need? What equipment do we need? Uh, when does the factory you know, safely shut down without compromising output? So combining both of them could lead to much more bigger advantages for our world. So how does the uh, summit, the GMIS uh, taking place in September, the digital uh, summit, how is it adding value to that discussion about global disruption, global transformation? Well. What we tend to do with our, our summits, I mean, 2017, when we held it in Abu Dhabi, we make sure that we have left a legacy there for Abu Dhabi, which was the Mohammed Bar Rashid Initiative for Global Prosperity, an open innovation platform that posts four challenges per cohort that, uh, that address sustainable development goal uh, uh, objectives, right? So we've had challenges to do with digital divide. We've had challenges to do with sustainable cities, sustainable energy, zero hunger. And, and we've, as, as of the end of our second cohort, which, uh, which will follow the Global Manufacturing and Industrialization Summit, third edition on September 4 and 5, we will be having uh, the day following that, the Mohammed Bar Rashid uh, session, uh, where uh, we're going to be announcing the winners of our second cohort. We've received over 3,000 solutions from all around the world, from places as far uh, as, uh, as uh, Southeast Asia to to, to the North, South America and North America, and, and most of the solutions have been coming from Africa. So that legacy has been left for Abu Dhabi. We've announced in 2019 during uh, GMIS uh, at, at Yekaterinburg in Russia that uh, we are going to set up a, uh, a uh, crowd uh, sourcing platform for nature inspired technology research, which we have dubbed the President's Challenge in, in light of President Putin's speech. And now in Germany, we have every reason to launch a legacy initiative for Germany that is reflective of what's on the minds and the hearts of every German citizen. And I do not want to share more about that because we would like to keep it as a surprise for our, our big event and uh, our virtual summit in, in, in September. But it will be something that is very specific about what the global audience wants to see from big companies and big corporations using technology. Yes, we have to keep some surprises back uh, for the uh, <laughs> delight of uh, audience. But I, I think uh, just as a final thought on this, it's so important whilst we remain realistic about the challenges uh, and clear headed about that, that we retain our optimism. There is enormous potential with this digital transformation to improve lives, to increase wealth, to uh, improve the well-being of mankind. Yeah. What's life without challenges, Declan? What's life without challenges? So we've, we've, like I said, we've taken challenges on before and every single time humanity has prevailed. And this is yet another challenge that I know with using the resources and the tools that we have, the digital tools, we will prevail. Bara al -Alama, thank you very much. That's the head of the organizing committee at the Global Manufacturing and Industrialization Summit, GMIS. I'm Declan Curry. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned for the rest of the Hanover Messe Digital Days.